In this lesson, we're going to talk about an overview of small bowel obstructions. So we're going to talk about what causes them, some of the risk factors for getting them. We're also going to talk about signs and symptoms, how they're diagnosed, and how they're treated. So what is a small bowel obstruction? So when we refer to the small bowel, we are referring to the small intestine. So in this diagram here, here is the small intestine. So if you were to swallow something, it goes down your esophagus into your stomach, and your stomach joins to the small intestine. And the small intestine winds around within your abdomen, eventually leading to the large intestine and completing the gastrointestinal tract. So a small bowel obstruction is a mechanical blockage of the small intestine, preventing or reducing passage of contents. Now this mechanical blockage can be a twist in the small intestine or it can be a kink in the small intestine and can be caused by a variety of things. We're going to talk about those in the next upcoming slides. What is the epidemiology of a small bowel obstruction? Males and females have equal incidences of a small bowel obstruction. And incidence increases with age because some of the risk factors we're going to talk about increase with age as well. So what are some of the risk factors? Some of them include prior abdominal surgeries, having a history of small bowel obstruction. So like other things in medicine, having a past history of something increases your risk for that same thing in the future. Having a history of malignancy, particularly gynecological malignancies, can increase your risk for a small bowel obstruction. And then inflammatory bowel disease is also a risk factor for having a small bowel obstruction. So inflammatory bowel disease, you can think of conditions like Crohn's disease. So those are some of the risk factors. Now let's talk about the causes of a small bowel obstruction. So they are similar to the risk factors, but we'll get into a bit more detail in this slide. So these include the following. Strictures. So strictures can cause a small bowel obstruction. Hernia. So a hernia is where the small bowel may pop out of the abdominal wall. So that can lead to a constriction or an occlusion of the small bowel. Adhesions. So adhesions can come from prior abdominal surgery. So, so when there's been open abdominal surgery, the scar tissue that remains afterwards can cause an adhesion to connect to the small intestine. There's a condition known as volvulus that can cause a small bowel obstruction. That is where the small bowel twists on itself. There's intussusception, which is when the small bowel telescopes onto itself. IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease, we talked about this before, Crohn's disease, is a risk factor for getting a small bowel obstruction. And then certain infections, like tuberculosis and parasites, can also cause a small bowel obstruction. We see these occurring more in the developing world. Neoplasm is malignancy, so cancers within the abdominal cavity can cause a small bowel obstruction. And then if gallstones are large enough, if there is a fistula between the gallbladder and the small bowel, we can get large stones that can be passed into the small bowel or small intestine, and these can block the small intestine. So you may notice that I have the first letters of each of these words in a particular color. And that's because we can remember these causes of a small bowel obstruction by the mnemonic shaving. So again, strictures, hernia, adhesions, volvulus, intussusception, IBD, and infection for the I in shaving, neoplasm, and gallstones. So those are the causes of a small bowel obstruction. Now there's another mnemonic that can be used to remember the top three causes of a small bowel obstruction. And this mnemonic is ABC. So the first one is adhesion. So A for adhesion, this is actually the most common cause of small bowel obstruction, particularly in those who have had a prior history of abdominal surgeries. So this is what an adhesion looks like. So when the patient has had open abdominal surgery and they get closed up, tissue can form between the abdominal wall and the small intestine. So there can be a piece of tissue that can attach from the abdominal wall to the small intestine and cause a kink in the small intestine, causing an occlusion or a blockage or a small bowel obstruction. The B in ABC stands for bulge. Now this is something we can use to remember hernias. So this is one of the top three causes. And then cancer or malignancy. So these are the top three causes of a small bowel obstruction, adhesion, bulges or hernias, and cancer. Now there are particular types of small bowel obstruction. These include partial. This is when the intestinal lumen is not completely occluded. And this is when 
there's some gas and fluids can still pass by the occlusion. So there can be a, a small occlusion, but there's still space for things to pass it. There can be a complete occlusion or complete small bowel obstruction. This is when the intestinal lumen is completely occluded. So the hollow tube of the intestine is completely blocked in a complete small bowel obstruction. And because it's completely blocked, there's no passage of gas and or fluids. There can also be something called a closed loop obstruction. So this is when there's a blockage or occlusion at two ends of a segment. So we can imagine that if there's one piece of small intestine, there's one part of it that is completely blocked. And then just downstream from that, there can be another part that's completely blocked. And there can be a part in the middle that is open, but there can be gas trapped in between those two blockages. So there's a proximal and distal occlusion. So that is called a closed loop obstruction. This can occur in a volvulus of the small intestines. And then we also can classify small bowel obstructions by non-strangulated, which means that the blood supply to the small intestine is not compromised, and then strangulated, which means that the blood supply is compromised. And these will determine the management of the small bowel obstruction. We'll talk about that later on in this lesson. So now that we know all those types of small bowel obstruction, let's talk about the clinical features. So one of the most important clinical features of a small bowel obstruction is abdominal pain. So this is a colicky abdominal pain. It's intermittent and crampy in nature, and it often occurs in the epigastric area or the umbilical area. So that is where this abdominal pain occurs. We can also see nausea and vomiting in a small bowel obstruction. This more likely occurs in severe cases of a proximal small bowel obstruction. So when some of the first parts of the small intestine, so the parts closest to the stomach, if they are occluded, it's more likely that a patient will have nausea and vomiting. And the vomiting is often bilious in nature. This occurs in 60 to 70% of cases, so it's quite common. And again, it may be bilious. Constipation can also occur. Constipation in this context is reduced or loss of bowel movements. So reduced bowel movements is considered constipation if there's complete cessation of bowel movements and complete cessation of passing gas or flatus. We call this obstipation. So constipation is when there's reduced amount of bowel movements, but when there's no bowel movements at all and no passing of gas at all, that is called obstipation. That is very, very key to a small bowel obstruction. If you see that with these other symptoms, that is very likely to be a small bowel obstruction. This occurs in 80 to 90% of cases. And it's also noted that if a patient is still passing stool and gas six to 12 hours after onset of symptoms, so some of these other symptoms, including abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting, this suggests partial small bowel obstruction. So if it was a complete small bowel obstruction, by six to 12 hours, there would be no more passing of stool and gas. And these are the classic symptoms, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and constipation or obstipation. But although they are classic symptoms, they are rarely all present at the same time. So you may see some of them, and then some of the other ones may occur later on. Constipation or obstipation may occur later on in presentation of this condition. Some other clinical features include abdominal distension. So that's when there is bloating of the belly. So you can see this large belly, and this is because there's gases trapped within the abdomen. So you can imagine that if there's a blockage, gases get trapped inside the abdomen, and then the belly can bulge. It's more likely to occur if the blockage is in a distal portion of the small intestine. So if it's in the distal ileum, the last part of the small intestine, before it meets the large intestine, if there's an occlusion there, that's more likely to cause abdominal distension. This occurs in 60% of cases. There can also be severe abdominal pain that is out of proportion to physical examination. This is more likely to occur if the small bowel obstruction becomes strangulated or if there's a bowel perforation. Fever can also occur in the same context as well as tachycardia. And again, these may occur in the event of bowel perforation or strangulation. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment. We'll first talk about the diagnosis. The diagnosis can be made by abdominal x-ray. It's important to have at least two views on the abdominal x-ray, a supine or flat, and an upright x-ray. And there are particular findings we can see with a small bowel obstruction on an abdominal x-ray. These include dilated loops of small bowel, so you can see some dilated loops here. At least 
two air fluid levels. Some references say at least three air fluid levels. And air fluid levels are these right here. So if you see at least three of them, or at least two, this is more likely to be a small bowel obstruction. Air fluid levels that are wider than 2.5 centimeters is also a important radiographic finding. And then air fluid levels within the same bowel loop that differ at least five millimeters. So these are significant radiographic findings on an abdominal x-ray for a small bowel obstruction. And then we can also see absent or minimal colonic gas. So when they look at the large intestine, if there's very little gas in the colon, that is also another finding. CT imaging or CT enterography can also be used. So CT imaging with contrast can be used to see if the contrast can go through the entire gastrointestinal tract. If it does, if that contrast does reach all the way to the rectum, this is an incomplete or partial small bowel obstruction. If it doesn't, that is a complete small bowel obstruction. Blood work can also be important to assess. So checking to see if the patient is hydrated properly, if there is any signs of tissue damage from a possible strangulated small bowel obstruction. So looking at LDH levels, these can all be important. And then it's also important to rule out colorectal cancer as well, because we mentioned that cancer can be a very important and often significant cause of a bowel obstruction. Now let's talk about the treatment of a small bowel obstruction. So with partial and non-strangulated obstructions, oftentimes they are managed non-operatively. So nasogastric tube is placed. So nasogastric tube is where there's a tube that is placed into the nose and it runs all the way down into the stomach. And this is done for decompression. So it essentially sucks out all of the stomach contents. So this can help with symptoms quite a bit. And approximately 70% of small bowel obstructions caused by adhesions can resolve spontaneously by this method. With the NG tube, fluid resuscitation is important. So IV fluids, analgesia, so pain control is important, and antiemetics, so helping the patient reduce nausea and vomiting. And these non-operative methods are utilized up to 72 hours. If there is no resolution of the small bowel obstruction after 72 hours, or if there is a strangulated small bowel obstruction, this is progressed to surgical intervention. So again, if there's no resolution after 72 hours of non-operative management, we go to surgery. If it's strangulated, it is a surgical emergency because that part of the bowel has compromised blood flow. And then surgery is often either open abdominal surgery or laparoscopic surgery. And this oftentimes can be utilized to remove whatever is obstructing the small bowel. So most times adhesions are going to be the most common cause of a small bowel obstruction. So surgery can go in and remove those adhesions. And then there can be some other causes that we've noted before, malignancy or others as well. So the surgery can go in and potentially remove those causes. So if you want to learn more about other types of gastroenterology conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.